Okay. All right. Again, welcome to the Marian Bible Fellowship. Today is August 12th. And the title to today's sermon is Your Walk and Your Witness. Does your walk mirror your witness? Your witness is defined as your verbal manifestation of your testimony of God. You know, often uh, your witness ends up be, your your witness ends up being uh, wrapped up in your your personal experience, different things that have happened to you. You know, often it's how were you saved? How how was the gospel exposed to you? You know, everybody has that that moment where they, they got that aha, where they understood that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, uh, where you change your thinking, where you thought, okay, he's just a really good person, but now I understand that he is the God, he is God, he is our Savior, he is our redemption. Now your walk is different, that is defined as the physical manifestation of God in your life. And that sometimes goes with, along with your history or your culture. Uh, how did you reach God consciousness? As I said, some people have that aha moment. Other people were, you know, through their parents were raised and always knew that, that there was something special about Jesus Christ and he wasn't this ordinary person or just a prophet. They, you knew something was special about him and then somebody comes along and tells you you have to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and you say, oh, okay, yes, I believe that. But that is your point of, of understanding that that is what you need, and that you are a sinner. Other people, their attachment to their walk and the witness come through their emotions. It's an emotional experience. Uh, that's how they communicate with God. If, if, if they don't feel uh, some force moving throughout the room, then they feel that the Holy Spirit isn't really there. You know, it's kind of like the the force in Star Wars. You remember Luke Skywalker and, and, and Yoda when he wanted to move something. He gets so dramatic and, you know, picking it up in the air, and that was the force. Many people look at the Holy Spirit like it's some kind of force or natural entity along with the earth that's in symbiont uh, uh, fellowship with the earth. But it's quite different. Holy Spirit, it's actually a He. Amen. But what should be the definer or the leading and the guidance for our walk and our witness? Should it be Bible doctrine? Should it be the final authority, the Word of God? Should that be what guides us and directs us and says, this is what your verbal manifestation of God should be, where you're not, you're, you're repeating and you're lifting from Scripture and communicating that to people. You know, I said earlier, I said, I don't really feel it's pleasure, plagiarism when I'm stealing it from the Bible. <laughs> you know, because I'm not supposed to give you my opinion. I'm supposed to give you what is in Scripture. Amen. Okay, that's what I'm supposed to be communicating for you. So it's not really plagiarism. God actually encourages plagiarism. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's why I don't touch any of my messages ahead of time. Yes, because I... Yeah, I, I <laughs> That, that's my old sin nature. I was a thief. <laughs> okay. I need my brothers to tell you that from my youth. Uh, you know, the Old Testament is filled with stories of saints and the times where they were used by God to to bring about and to praise His name or to uh, or to reach another people, as with with Jonah and the Ninevites. And the Bible is full of those stories. The thing I like a lot is it also tells you about their difficulties and the mistakes that they make. Mm -hmm. and, and why do you think they do that? They do that as a warning for us to so not to fall into the same pit. You know, I've described to my children, I said, you know, the job of a parent is to stand on a road that I walked down and got punched in the face or got knocked down. And I stand on that road trying to block my children saying, don't go, that, don't go this way. Don't go this way. I know what's down this road. Yeah. But, you know, as, as young, the young do, we sit there and say, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. And, yeah. and, and walk right past down that road, and you also get punched in the face. <laughs> so, but this is what these, some of these stories in the Old Testament are for. It's, it's a, a warning for us. Uh, and 
we're going we're gonna to look at one of those stories today. We're going to look at the story of King David. And we're going to look at a period in his life where his witness didn't match up with his walk. And they were at odds with each other. So turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. to where we're going to start our reading. Forgive me, there's going to be a lot of reading today, but uh, that kind of teaching isn't all bad. As I said, it's my job to give you what's in Scripture. Don't worry, I'll give you a little of my, my opinion and commentary along with it. <laughs> all right, so we're going to start right at verse 1. And it says, And it came to pass that after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David set Joab, and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rahab. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. Let me stop here. Notice that the story starts off by highlighting that David was somewhere where he ought not be. Kings in those, back in those times, they went to battle with their troops. They, they, led, they led the charge into battle. But David stayed back. You know, my wife often tells me, you know, when I have a day off or something, I have, it's my day off. You're lucky if I even want to get out of bed. Mm -hmm. But my wife has my honey, her honey to do list, or honey I wish you would do list, <laughs> where she wants me to do certain things around the house. And it's often I'll surprise her. Like I surprised her, I put a, put a uh, ceiling fan in the kitchen. She's been talking about that for a while. So she came home Friday, and boom, there's a ceiling fan in the kitchen. Which, you know, got a smile on her face. But David here was, David here was not where he should be. And often when sin comes upon us, it's because we're someplace that we ought not be. Right. If you're out in the street at 3 o'clock in the morning, are you going to be surprised that you run into sin? Are you going to be, you know, you hear about all these shootings, Syracuse, it was a couple of weeks ago. Every morning that I got up, I turned the news on, they were reporting on a shooting that had happened the night before. It was like a straight week, a shooting every night or a stabbing or something. And it was never, it was never at 5 o'clock in the afternoon or 3 o'clock when people are at work. It was always in the, in the, in the witching hour, in the late hour when when these things are occurring. So, you know, I warn you children, this is why your parents don't want you out hanging out at late hours of the night, because that's when trouble is out there. People who, who start trouble are usually out <laughs> after 12 o'clock when most decent people are in sleeping and getting rest and getting ready to go to work the next morning. Mm -hmm. So, if you're going to be someplace that you're not supposed to be, like David was, you very well may run into something that you ought not be running into. It's sinful. Verse 2 says, And it came to pass in the evening tide that David arose from his, off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Now again, here David is getting up on um, the bed in the evening. <laughs> okay? So like me, he's been lounging around all day. Why? Because he's not where he's supposed to be. His troops, his men, all Jerusalem is out fighting and defending the nation and, and working the, the, uh, the will of God. But where is he? He's back, in, he's back in the castle, walking around, getting up in the evening tide, still got his robe on, walking around, and all of a sudden he sees this beautiful woman bathing down. Oh, check this out. Okay? So here David, separated from his normally kingly duties, arises late in the evening. Often when we have idle time on our hands, it's an opening for sin. When you're, when, you're, when you're not keeping yourself busy, when you're not out working, when you don't have to go to bed early because you've got to get up early the next morning, well then you can stay up late and do all kind of, get into all kinds of things that you really ought not be getting into. You have idle time on your hands. And that's what David had. David had idle time on his hands. So, and another thing is, he's walking about and he sees a beautiful woman. Now, I'm a man just like David. 
And whether you love your wife or your husband or not, if you don't protect your eye gate, you have to protect the gates that come into the mind. You've got to protect your eyes. You have to protect your ears. You have to protect your all your five senses. Your five senses are your input to your CPU, to your central processing unit. In a computer, you have the central processing unit. You have a keyboard that you can input stuff. You've got scanners that you can input stuff. So you've got different ways of inputting to that CPU. Your human body is the same way. You've got different ways of inputting information into your CPU. And once it's in there, then it's going to start working. Okay, it's going to start working. So you've got to protect your eye gate. So when your phone goes off and some porn comes up on it, you've got to protect your eye gate. You can't sit there and Oh, okay, let me just take a look. Click, and then you're in. Then, then, it, then it's got you. Then it's got you. Now it's in, you're internalizing it. You're bringing it in. You haven't protected your eye gate. And here, David didn't protect his eye gate. David gazed upon her. David didn't see her like, oh, we can respect her privacy. Which I'm sure she wasn't trying to be too private because her thing was probably wide open so that the king could see it. She wasn't unaware mm -hmm. of uh, the fact that she was in the visual, uh, the visual line of sight of the of the of the palace. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's not think that she was totally innocent here. But David, David was should have respected her privacy. So the next verse says three, and David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Beersheba the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her. For she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. You know, the sin that penetrates the eye gate enters the mind and becomes an action. David sent for her. So that came into his eye gate, and it got into his mind, and it formulated as a plan. Let me send people for I'm the king. It's good to be the king. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so he sent for her. He sent his, his staff for her. That would be like President Trump's chief of staff driving up here saying, uh, the president would like to see you. Well, that's no. <laughs> no, you're, he's the president of the United States. You're going to go. David was the king of all Israel. She didn't have a choice whether she won. But like I said, she, the Bible doesn't give us anything that says that she fought and she claim that she didn't want to go anything else. She went. Okay? And when... Uh, isn't it funny how when guilt of sin settles in, how casually we repent and think because we are saved that this sin is without consequence. Yeah. It says that she purified herself of her uncleanness and went back home. And everything was normal. Every, you know, I had a good time with the king. Let me get back to my life. Five says, And the woman conceived and sent and told David, and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war prospered. And David said unto Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house. And there followed him a, a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and went not down to his house. So now David said the consequence is now coming. Is now coming. You know, we talk about you know, that Jesus Christ paid for sin on the cross. He paid for all sin. But there's still natural consequence when you sin. There's still things that are going to occur when you sin that you have to deal with here on earth. Amen. Just because you have the protection of the Almighty God, which we do, that's talking about the here and after. That's talking about your eternity. When you want to follow in sin here on earth now, it has consequence. Amen. It has things that you've got to deal with. And this is now David had to deal with. 
She was now pregnant. He was the king. What a scandal that would have been yeah. for the king of Israel to have gotten a woman pregnant. It was another man's wife, one, you know, one in his army. But what a controversy. So David's mind started started working. And how can I, what am I going to do here? Oh, and David came up with a plan. So he calls Uriah back from the from the field and, and, and brings, him, brings him in and says, oh, you know, how's the war going? How are things going? Give me your report. So he gets him in, and then he says, you know what? Go on home. I'll kick back for a couple. He was hoping, he was hoping that Uriah would go and sleep with his wife, and then he could push it off and say, oh, well, that's Uriah's baby. You know, they didn't have Maury Povich back then. Right. DNA. <laughs> they couldn't do the DNA testing. Right. You know. I'm sure, I'm sure it had they, I'm sure David would have been screaming, I'm not the baby's daddy. Yeah. I'm not his daddy. Yeah, me. <laughs> so, so now that the natural consequence of their sin has manifested, David goes into operation cover-up. Mm -hmm. How can I cover this up? Uriah having honor and integrity unwittingly spoils David's plan for a cover-up. Just because he would not indulge, not when, not when his men are out in the field suffering. He says, how can I, how can I go and enjoy the comforts of my wife when, when my men are out in the field in battle? You know, God forbid, I can't do this. David now digs a deeper hole in which to bury himself. Next verse 10 says, And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said, David said unto Uriah, Comest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst not thou go down unto thine house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark in Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in open fields. Shall I then go unto mine house and eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? And thou livest? As thou livest, and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. And David said unto Uriah, Tarry here today also. And tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and made him, him drunk. And at the evening, at the even, when he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his lord, but went not down to his house. So David sat there and saw that he slept on the on the on the stoop of the of the castle. And what was the first thing you think David said? <sighs> you know, you ever you ever you ever have that where you know you're trying to cover something up, you've got some plan to cover something up or do something and it doesn't work. What's the first thing you say? <sighs> okay, what I gotta do now? What, 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 how can I change this plan to, to bring about what I, what I want here? So David decided, let me bring him, let me bring him into, into my table. If I offer him alcohol, he's not going to refuse the king. What a, that, that was a huge insult for you to refuse something from the hand of the king. It almost bring death upon you. So Uriah gets drunk. And why did David get him drunk? Because when you're drunk, you make bad decisions. When you're drunk, you're not thinking about your integrity as Uriah was thinking about his integrity and not going lying with his wife. He was thinking of others, not just himself. But when you're drunk and you're being led by, by alcohol, you make bad decisions. How many women have become pregnant because of alcohol? Those bad choices. So, but still, even though Uriah was drunk, he made the right decision and would not go into his own house. So David, trying to bring his plan to fruition, it keeps coming up empty here. It keeps coming up empty. None of it's working. So it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab. You remember Joab is Uriah's general. Mm -hmm. And sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the front forefront of the hottest battle, and retire from him, that he may be smitten and die. So now David has 
he's went from adultery, now he's moving into murder. He's written a letter to the general who was over Uriah, and he says, send him into the hottest part of the battle. Send him to the front line and abandon him. That's what retire from him means. You know, sometimes in you know the King James they use these real formal old words, but that retire from him means abandon him. Sit, leave him there by himself. And leave him behind enemy lines at the front by himself. So that he will he will die. So David's sin causes him to progress. And just like chain smoking, where we light one cigarette after another. We can, we can chain sin, performing one sin after another, trying to cover up the last. You know, when the back when I used to smoke, we'd get a, a break at the hospital, and I used to work double shifts. We'd work all day, all day, all day. You wouldn't get, get, get a break. And you finally get a break, and you run out there so you can smoke a cigarette. Boy, you smoke three or four cigarettes in a, in a short time. <laughs> like, you know, sometimes you don't even use the lighter. You use the last one to light up the next one. <laughs> all right? But that's how sin that's how sin is. You start sinning, then you have to do other sins to cover up that sin. See, because you have a good witness and you want your walk to match it. So you're 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 trying to hide things from people. You're trying to hide that sin that you do every day, that yeah. that sin that you try to keep in darkness. And, and David was David was fighting to keep this sin in darkness. He didn't want it to come to light. He didn't want to have to deal with it. He didn't want to be confronted with it. So now he's progressed from adultery and getting a, a woman pregnant that wasn't his wife. Now he's progressed to murder, to actually murdering one of his own countrymen, one of his own servants. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto the place where he knew the valiant men were. In other words, where you put your... Your best fighters, your ones where you want, you know, the the different services have different purposes. You know, everybody's asked, what do you need an army, a navy, an air force, a, a marines? Now they're talking about what, space force? Okay, why do you have all these different services? Because each service has a different purpose, a different mission. And Dennis and I were both marines, and the, the purpose of the marines are to be the first to fight. We are to land on the beach in enemy front, and we are to push people back. We are to take territory. We're not to occupy it. We're just to sit there, take this beach, and push forward. Take that land, keep going. And then the army comes in and occupies the area that we just kicked butt and took. Okay? So here, the valiant men were up at the front. They were, they were the Marines. They're the ones that are the, the hardest fight, the pushing forward. And that's where he put Uriah, right in the heat of the battle, where he, where he knew the valiant men, the best men were. And then he abandoned them and left him at the front lines in the heat of the battle by himself. And he charged the messenger, saying, <clears throat> When thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king, if it so be that the king's wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approached ye so nigh unto the city, when ye did fight, know ye not that they would shoot from the wall? Who smote Abimelech, the son of Jerob Jerobish? Did not the woman cast a piece of a millstone upon him from the wall? Then he died in Thes Thesbe? Thesbes? Why went ye nigh the wall? Then say thou, the servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. So what he was saying here is, what made you do this stupid thing? <clears throat> what made you choose this battle plan? He's saying when he's giving a report to the king, and the king starts asking these questions, why did you rush the wall? Don't you know, didn't, didn't before they throw rocks down and kill people at the wall? Why would you, why would you do the same strategy the second time when it, didn't, when it wasn't successful the first time? He says, when the king's wrath arises because all these men got killed, he says, what I want you to say to him is say, the servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Because what do you think is going to happen? David's going to go like this. Oh, okay. Because now none of that matters. <clears throat> none of it matters who else got killed. As long as, as, long as uh, the, the Hittite was killed. And now his secret is safe. 
So that's what he was telling the servant. He says, when when he when his wrath gets up, this is how you're going to calm him right back down. Because usually as a messenger, when you brought bad information like that to the king, you, you might lose your life. They may kill you for being the messenger and bringing bad news. But he's like, this is how you'll be able to save your life. So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab had sent for him. And the messenger said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto, into the field, and we were upon them even unto the entering of the gate. And the shooters shot from the wall upon thy servant, and some of the king's servants be dead. And, they, and thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle plan strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage thou him. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband, and when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife, and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So everything, everything's fine. Uriah's dead. David's secret is safe. His wife has gone through the proper mourning period. And she can now, when the husband's dead, she by Jewish law can take another husband. And who's that husband? Who? It's David. If she's already pregnant by him, why not? <laughs> so she had, they have this baby. Joab unloads all this bad news, and at the end concludes with Uriah the Hittite uh, is also dead. In other words, mission accomplished. Everything, because Joab, remember, he, he had that sealed letter, so he knew what David was doing. And, and it's important that that letter was sealed, because he put it in the hand of Uriah. He had him carry his own death warrant. So he seals it, and death would come to you if you broke the seal of, of the king's seal. You know, it says that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the, same, the same principle. The Holy Spirit seals us and says we are His. And that seal cannot be broken. Not until the day of redemption when He redeems us. Alright? So this seal that He put on Uriah knew. I, I can't, I can't, and Uriah was an integrable, honorable man. He, he proved his integrity and his honesty. So David had no problem putting this, this, this message in his hand, his own death warrant, and he delivered it. Now, I'm sure David must have felt quite comfortable in his sin. You know, when we live in our sin long enough, yeah. don't we start to feel comfortable in it? Amen. We start feeling, well, it's okay, even though we know in God's God's uh, God's word tells us that this is wrong what we're doing. Well, we just start feeling a little bit comfortable in it. And that's what happens when you allow sin to remain in your life, <clears throat> and it, it is unconfronted by your spirit. When your spirit accepts and says, "Okay, well, you know, this is just how I am, or this is just how things are, or I can't afford to do this, or or whatever, I can't afford to, to serve God's word." You know, I'm a good Christian. I come to church every Sunday. You know, God's just going to have to deal with this one part of me. This is how I am. You know, I'm sure I, I can imagine what what was it that David was saying that, that justified in his mind what he just did. But he became comfortable with it somehow. And when sin is allowed to take root in your life, don't be surprised when it grows. You allow it to get good roots in fertile ground, it's going to grow. And especially when you feed it every day. You know, you have a plan. I always joke with Raquel, because <coughs> we don't have good light in this house. A plant needs light. <coughs> it needs watering. It needs to be taken care of. Sin is the same way. You plant sin in your life and you don't water it. You don't pay attention to it. Sin is a jealous lover. It wants to be paid attention to. It wants your attention. It wants your time. And it won't grow, not unless you give it all those things. You need to excise sin out of your life. In verse 12, in chapter 12, excuse me, we had finished up chapter 11, beginning of chapter 12, it says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, 
there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. Now, Nathan was the prophet, by the way. For those who didn't know, Nathan was a prophet. Israel, when it had a king, David was the second king, it always kept a prophet. Because the prophet was to receive the word of God and, and give guidance and leadership to the king. Okay, so Nathan comes unto him. And he says, And the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe lamb. Does everybody know what an ewe lamb is? It means a female. A female lamb. A male is a ram. A female is an ewe. E W E, an ewe. Pronounced ewe. Ewe. <laughs> okay. So, which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him, with his children, and did eat of his own meat, and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. Or as I would say, was unto him as a Nova. <laughs> Our dog Nova rules this house. She sleeps where she wants, she eats where she wants, and everybody is here to serve her. Okay? So this is what this lamb was to this guy. It was a family member. It was a family pet. It was beloved. Okay? And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring men that was to come unto him. So in other words, he was to receive a visitor. A visitor was coming to visit him. And he didn't want to take from his own flock and slay one of his, his animals to feed him. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for, the, for that man, for the man that was coming unto him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said unto Nathan, As the Lord liveth, and the man hath, hath done this thing, shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan's... Oh, let me stop there for a second. So David gets enraged, and he says, This, this rich man took the one ewe lamb from this, from this poor man and, and, and slaughtered that instead of slaughtering one of his many? He says, this man, he should restore him fourfold, and he should die. And Nathan the prophet says unto him, said to David, Thou art the man. You are the man. You have done this. You know, sometimes when, when you've justified sin in your life so long, you get to the point where you'll see somebody else sinning, and boy, you'll, you'll issue judgment down upon them. How could this person do this? Oh my goodness, how could they sin against God that way? You forget about what you've been doing. You forget all about that. That's exactly what David did. David was so enthroned in his sin, he had justified it away and married Bathsheba and everything was fine now. And so he didn't even recognize that Nathan the prophet was talking about him. He had given him a parable about himself. Yeah. It is, an easy, it is always easier for us to judge the sin of others than to see it in ourselves. Here is David's walk and his witness were in conflict. David would judge harshly a man doing the exact evil work that he was doing. And that's what happens. You know, we all, we all are professing Christians. And we go out in the street and we preach the gospel and we... We present ourselves, our, our witness for God is strong. We'll debate down and we'll talk and we'll spread the gospel. But does our walk mirror that? Are we prepared when those who are closest to us and know us well and see the sin in us, are we prepared to be confronted about it? Because that's what happened here. Nathan confronted David about his sin. Matthew 7, 5, it states, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out, uh, out, out of thy brother's eye. So you're trying to take a splinter out of your brother's eye, but you're not looking at the big, huge beam that is in your own. So when we allow sin to remain in our lives, sooner or later, we will be confronted with it. Somebody's going to confront us with it. And although sin was judged at the cross, we suffer the natural consequences of our sin. When you sin, it's going to bring about certain things in your life. It's just the natural way things happen. 
we thought we saw. Yep. Nathan reveals the natural consequences of David's sin. Now, David repented of his sin. And he turned back to God. But there were all kind of natural consequences that were going to go along with this sin. And we read it, Samuel 12, 7 through 12, and it says, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. In other words, I would have withheld nothing from you. God tells David here, I would have given you anything. Any, any desire of your heart. So wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will make thee make thy wives before thy eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with, with thy wives in the sight of this son. And thou did it, thou did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. So God pronounces judgment on David. He says, The sword will never leave your house. You'll never have peace. You will always be in conflict and war. And then he says, I'm going to raise up evil out of your own house. I'm going to turn your own children against you. And all these things came to pass. David's own son was after him, trying to kill him, trying to take the throne from him. This is what caused the split of Israel. You have the ten northern tribes and you have the tribes of Judah. That split happened because David's son tried to, uh, to, try to take the throne and took the ten northern tribes with him. So these are the natural consequences. Sin was, as I said, sin was paid for at the cross. God's mercy and grace was not given as a license to sin. The natural consequences of sin are given to guide us towards the path of righteousness that God has laid before us. The natural consequences of your sin are not for punishment. They are to guide you and lead you back. And to let you know, yes, I'm, I'm in sin. I need, to, I need to adjust to the justice of God. I need to get back on the path that He's laid before me. You're not supposed to just sit in it and be comfortable in it and accept it. If you know what you're doing is wrong, change it. And if you say, well, I can't afford to change it, do you think that God will not support you? This is where trusting in God comes in. Trust in God to do the right thing. Trust in God to follow along His path. Do you think that there won't be an abundance on the path of God? Do you think that He will not sustain you? He has sustained you this far? Amen. Different from David, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit with the promise of redemption. In Psalms 51.11, David prays, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. This is something that was he was in danger of. We're not in danger of that. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. We're not in danger of that. But you are in danger of the natural consequence of your sin. And Paul even says that there was one in Corinth that he gave him over to Satan for the destruction of his body so that the soul may be saved. So we must expel sin from our life. If we don't, it will grow and it will seek to define you and can affect you and your generations to come, just as it did with David. What you model for your children will become normal for them. We see now that there's so many people who are living together instead of getting married. That is because it was, it was more popular in my generation. It was unheard of by my father's generation. It started becoming more popular in mine. What you must decide is, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. If anyone out there we must 
first recognize that we are sinners and that we need a Savior. That we need Jesus Christ. We need what He did for us on the cross. We, need, we needed Him to sacrifice Himself. That we cannot do this of, of our own selves. We cannot, we cannot save ourselves. Next, you must understand that you can't save yourself and that you only by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The fact that He gave Himself on the cross and had the sins of the world imputed to Him, died on the cross, was dead for three days, and then was raised again by the Father. And this is what secures our salvation. So if there's anyone out there, right there in your seat, you can pray pray that, that Father, I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And in that, I am saved. I, I have the blessed assurance that I am saved. I, I am accepting you at your word. You know, they say that you got to have faith. you got to have faith in what? you got to have faith in Jesus Christ, in His sacrifice pay for your sins. And in Him, you are complete. Amen. 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 On the back of your pamphlets, we always put the Gospel. The Gospel that saves. The Gospel that saves during this dispensation. God, the dispensation of grace. And it says, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the Gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That is the only way to be saved, that is the only way to be reconciled unto God, and to attain eternal life. Amen. 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 Praise God. All right. Michael, if you want to go ahead and close up in prayer, uh, Lord, we'll jump back to the prayer. Oh, dear Father, we do praise you and thank you once again for the wonderful message this morning. Let us take it to heart. We trust the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and uh, to convince us of sin and to uh, redirect us uh, on the right path so that we may walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh that we may bring honor and glory to you. Uh, we've been called unto righteousness. We've been called unto holiness to walk in a way that's pleasing in your sight. And help us also, Lord, to be a good witness and a good testimony to the world that they may see Christ in us and bring honor and glory to your name and also to desire to come unto you and to be saved because they see uh, a good witness uh, in those believers that are here today. Help us now. We do ask for your guidance and directions always in our lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.